Um, last night, John, in his talk, um, did a little summary of our connection with a movement of God's people that's called Mennonite Brethren. It's, what, it's our church family. It's who we're a part of. And I loved what he said. I don't know that I've ever heard anybody say it in a minute and a half like that. Like, that was really tight. Our family puts the teachings of Jesus at a premium, at a, as a point of emphasis. Our tradition sees Jesus as the revelation of God. Our family has a passion for social justice. Our tradition works for the good of people, those who are Christians and those who are not Christians, all people. Our family believes in the ministry of reconciliation, not just for us to God, but also us to us. We need to be reconciled to each other in relationships. Our tradition is a tradition of peace. 500 years ago, when others were burning people for believing the wrong things, our tradition, our family said, there must be a better way. Our tradition is convinced that the way of the gospel is the way of peace. Our tradition is a tradition of community. And that's what this is all about. Of togetherness. That's why we're here together. That's what it means to be Mennonite brethren. And you and I are a part of that. I'm not Mennonite brethren because of my last name. I'm Mennonite brethren because this family of churches flesh out the kingdom of God and the Jesus-looking God better than any other family that I've seen. That's why I'm Mennonite brethren. We're going to expand that a little bit today and let you hear some more, just fill out that story for you a little bit. Sometimes you may have found, especially with people who are maybe outside of your youth group or outside of church circles that you run in, that the name Mennonite Brethren kind of catches you up a little bit, like people... Do you like that? Or why do you have that name? And that kind of thing. And so sometimes we have a hard time getting friendly with it. It's really important to understand that behind that name is an unbelievable story of God working through people to draw people to himself. I mean, a really beautiful story. And so Wendell, welcome Wendell. He's going to talk some more about that right now. Isn't Stephen awesome? Let's give him a hand. <laughs> so here we are, wrapping up Name 2015, our National Mennonite Brethren Youth Conference. Some of you are here thinking, hey, I came for a youth conference, but who are the Mennonite Brethren? I could say that the Mennonite Brethren is a small Christian denomination made up of people who know that they are sinners saved by grace and believe in Christ's work on the cross for the salvation of their sins and are committed to following Jesus daily in a life of discipleship. But there's a beautiful story behind that. Can I share that story with you? It goes back <clears throat> to the 16th century, to a time that is known as the Reformation. The Bible was put in print form and put in people's hands so they could read it for themselves. And they began to, to read this Bible and realize that authority comes, uh, God's authority comes from Scripture alone, not from the word of a priest or a pope. And our relationship with Jesus uh, comes through faith alone, not through the tradition and ritual of the church. And so there was a group of people who wanted to reform the church and push against the excesses and indulgences of, <clears throat> excuse me, the Catholic Church at the time. But there was another group of people that were called the radicals. They wanted to renew the church and bring it back to what we see in the New Testament. I have a picture on the screen here of three gentlemen, Conrad Grable, George Blaurock, and Felix Montz. These radicals, among other things, believe that infant baptism doesn't make you a Christian. Baptism is a, an expression of a faith of believers. They believe something in called believer's baptism. 
So these three gentlemen in 1525 in the River Limat in Zurich, Switzerland, baptized each other. That sounds like a, an interesting event, but to the church and to the state, which were virtually one and the same, this was treason. They were hunted down and captured. Felix Mons, the one in the middle, <clears throat> when he was captured, he was ordered to recant this radical faith. When he refused, he was sentenced to death by drowning. They put him in a boat, took him out to the river, uh, river Limat in the middle. He was given one more opportunity to recant. And the story goes, he looked up on the shoreline and he saw his family. And they held their arms up like this, with the fingers together, signifying stay true to Christ. Stay true to Christ. And he was drowned that day in the very river in which he was baptized. Well, this sparked a wave of persecution for many years. The next slide shows some images from, um, from the, yeah, there it is, from the martyr's mirror. Many of them, uh, uh, these Anabaptists, these radicals, were, of course, drowned, and many were burned at the stake. But this movement didn't end. In fact, it grew and it flourished. There's a former Catholic priest from the Netherlands named Menno Simons. He was following this movement. He became sympathetic to these radicals, these Anabaptists, and he began preaching and writing about this radical faith. And those who read his writings, heard his teaching, listened to his preaching, they were derisively called little Menos or Mennonites. One of his most notable works was something we now call true evangelical faith. And here's a summary of what he wrote there. True evangelical faith cannot lie dormant. It clothes the naked. It feeds the hungry. It comforts the sorrowful. It shelters the de destitute. It serves those that harm it. It binds up that which is wounded, it has become all things to all people. Well, the persecution continued for years, and as a, a way to escape this persecution, these Mennonites, who were known as good farmers, accepted an invitation from Tsar Catherine the Great, Tsar of Russia, and they had an invitation to move to the Ukraine. Uh, and a region by the Black Sea along the Dnieper River to reclaim some swamp land and turn it into fertile farmland. In exchange, they were able to live in colonies, continue to speak German. They didn't have to uh, become part of the Russian military, but most importantly, they could worship God freely as they chose. Those first few years were awful. The disease and death was rampant. Those years then were followed by years of tremendous prosperity. Some had called this the golden years of the Mennonites. But along with that prosperity came a spiritual decline and a drift away from Jesus. There's a group of 17 men who were influenced by a traveling preacher. And they were trying to convince their fellow believers that we needed to get back to the scriptures and following Jesus and being led by the Holy Spirit. These 17 men and their families eventually broke away from the Mennonites 
and they were derisively called the Brethren, Mennonite Brethren. Well, several years later, in 1874, there began a migration for about 10 years of over 10,000 Mennonites and the Mennonite Brethren looking for a better life in North America. And as you can guess, they were farmers. They landed in agricultural regions, Kansas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, North and South Dakota, another wave out to California and Oregon and on the West Coast. Our churches from North Carolina, our churches from South Texas were born out of mission movements, out of those early Mennonite brethren. Now the Mennonite brethren have grown. We have over 230 churches, more than 70,000 Christian believers across this country of colleges and seminaries and this small Christian denomination has a lot to offer our world and the broader Christian community. Let me talk about a couple of things. Let's go to the next slide. If I were to summarize the Mennonite brethren and what we might believe, it doesn't capture everything, but I would say it's about following Jesus. We are known as people of the book, the book being the Bible, and we take the scriptures seriously. It becomes uh, our authority for faith and practice. We know something or we experience something called the obedience of faith. That means that if we are to have faith in Jesus, true faith in Jesus means we must obey Jesus. And we won't come to have real faith unless we obey, but we can't obey unless we have faith. It, it, it's a, a paradox, but faith and belief and obedience all go together. We believe that Jesus was God's son. And Jesus was the fullest revelation of God here on earth. And while he was here, we believe that Jesus meant what he said and was talking to us. So, when Jesus says, love your enemies, even enemies of God, and pray for those who persecute you, we take that seriously. Try to work that out in our own lives, and it's not easy, but it's what Jesus calls us to do. We also follow Jesus' model of how he treated the poor, the weak, the lowly, the marginalized, with compassion and love. That's how Jesus lived. We also embrace what's called the Great Commission. The last words of Jesus before he ascended into heaven, he said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. We believe that. Let's go to the next slide. If we were to summarize what it means to follow Jesus, it's about having a personal faith commitment to Jesus, which then grows into a life of daily discipleship, living as though Jesus was living in us. We believe in the authority of Scripture. And that Scripture then is worked out and understood and interpreted by this broader community of faith. And we also proclaim the good news of Jesus with both our words and our actions. And it's this kind of radical discipleship, this radical faith, that has led us to be a mission-minded people. Did you know there are more Mennonite Brethren Christians in India than all of North America? There are more Mennonite Brethren Christians in Africa than all of North America. We're planting churches from coast to coast and around the world. We heard great stories yesterday of what's going on in Thailand and Laos. God is on the move through this tiny denomination called Mennonite Brethren, people committed to following Jesus and making an impact in our world. 
So here's the invitation I have for you. This is the MB story. But it can also be your story. And that's part of what it means to be named is to know our identity and to know our story. And I would encourage you to embrace this as your story. And I would encourage you to live it out beginning today by doing three things. Having a faith commitment to Jesus and being committed to living out that faith daily in discipleship as an apprentice to Jesus. That you have a commitment to a faith community, the body of Christ, the family of God that we know as the church, and you invest your life in those relationships, and they can pour back into you. This Christian life isn't meant to be lived alone. And then you have a commitment to proclaim the good news of Jesus with your words and with your actions in the way that Jesus did, with love, service, and compassion. And when you do that, you will change your world. This is your story. This is how you are named.